Good morning. I'm uh, David Berto. I'm a senior vice president here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. On behalf of our president and CEO, Dr. John Hamry, I want to welcome you all to this outstanding conference today. I'd also like to welcome our viewers on the web. Um, we're sorry you can't be here with us. It's a lot more fun here than it is where you are, uh, but we're delighted that you can join us anyway. Dr. Hamry is actually disappointed that he's not here this morning to be able to, uh, to start this off. He's actually in Tokyo on his way to Korea. I'm sure he will come back with a solution and make this entire conference uh, a useless exercise in, that, in thinking. But uh, in case he does not, uh, we actually have quite a, an outstanding uh, lineup here today. Uh, I'd like to remind you from administrative purposes, if you're in the room here, to please uh, turn off or silence your cell phones and, and other devices so that, uh, or, or if you're not going to silence them, turn them up real loud so that when they go off we can know who you are very quickly and, uh, and assist you. Um, Today's conference, strengthening U.S. strategic cooperation with the Republic of Korea with a particular focus on nuclear governance and the North Korea problem, is a, is a co-hosted conference. It's the second in a series that we're doing uh, in collaboration with the East Asia Institute. And it's really quite a, an honor to be aligned and affiliated with a, another think tank that is uh, nonpartisan in its approach and uh, objective in its analysis. And we're delighted uh, to be partnering with the East Asia Institute here today. Um, the topic we have has really been around for quite some time. In fact, you go back almost 64 years to September 26th, 1949. That's the day that the U.S. government announced that we were no longer the sole nuclear power on the planet. And we acknowledged that the Soviet Union also had what we then called atomic bombs. Uh, ever since then, the question has been, how do we manage both as a nation and as a globe the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Nowhere is that issue more focused and important than it is today with, the, with North Korea. So our panels today are full of experts. You've got the agenda. I won't go through the whole thing. You have a morning panel. You have a break. You have a second panel. We have a distinguished luncheon speaker. And then we close out the day. All of it is worthwhile. Um, the first two are kind of setting the stage uh, for the last one, which will say what we do going forward. So it's really quite a quite an array, if you will. I also want to thank President Lee of the East Asia Institute and Chairman Ha for their partnership in co-hosting this event. But in addition, it's important to recognize one other contributor. You know, we're a, a not-for-profit organization, but that does not mean we're pro-loss. So we actually do uh, have to have funding, and it's with the generous support of Samsung Electronics America that this platform event and this series is made possible, and we're very grateful uh, to Samsung for that support, if you will. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Chairman Ha up to uh, uh, make some additional opening remarks. Um, uh, Yong Sun Ha is the chairman of the Board of Trustees at the East Asia Institute. Uh, he's also an emeritus professor in the Department of Political Science and International Relations at Seoul National University. He has a long and distinguished career both as an academic and as a proponent for cooperation and the advancement of civilization on the Korean Peninsula. Chairman Ha, would you like to come up, please? Thank you very much. On behalf of East Asia Institute as a co-organizer of these meetings, I would like to say thanks to the CSIS for the excellent arrangement of today's conference and ROKUS strategic cooperation with special emphasis on the nuclear governance and North Korean problems. I also would like to welcome all the participants of this meeting. The first topic we will discuss today is mutual efforts for strengthening ROK-US nuclear cooperation. As we all know, both governments re agreed recently two years extension of ROK-US 1-3 agreement. However, to avoid another two years extension of this arrangement, it is urgent to have an imaginative and also constructive discussion 
for the idea of win-win strategy uh, uh, both countries and three major issues. First, we need further discussions on nuclear fuel cycle management, including future-oriented development, uh, proliferation resistant pyroprocessing technology, and the long-term reliable supply of enriched uranium for the domestic and exported ROK nuclear power plants. Second, we have to solve together a new equation of competition and cooperation and the global nuclear business of constructing more than 200 nuclear power plants over the world in the next several decades. Third, we need to put together collective wisdom on the development of the sophisticated mechanism of global, regional, inter-Korean, and domestic governance for non-proliferation. It is clear that three major questions we have to answer is not an easy homework, but I do believe today's conference will contribute to opening the window opportunity for strengthening ROK US nuclear proliferation. The The second topic is North Korean problems. After the missile launch in last December and third nuclear test in February this year, Kim Jong-un government announced a new strategic lineup concurrently development of nuclear arsenal and economy in March 31st. It is not yet clear to decipher the nature of Kim Jong-un's new strategic line in comparison with his father's military, military first policy. However, because of the incompatibility of economic development with nuclear weapons and the midst of non-negotiable non-proliferation policies of US, China, and South Korea, Kim Jong-un's new strategic line will face the risk of vegetable state. It means that the only survival strategy will be another new two-track strategic line of security and economy without nuclear weapon. Under the current situation, we have to share the in-depth analysis of North Korean Kim Jong-un's two-track strategic line and also collaborate together to produce the co-evolution strategy of relative relevant countries of South Korea, United States, China, and other major powers for the beginning of North Korea's new strategic line of security and e economy without nuclear weapon. Finally, I believe that right after the successful summit meeting between two countries, Today's conference will contribute to developing ideas for further strengthening, strengthening ROK US strategic cooperation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ha. That um, is a nice uh, opening for today's. Meeting, I'm Sharon Squassoni. I direct the Proliferation Prevention Program here at CSIS. I'm actually standing in for Dr. Victor Cha, who is right now uh, at uh, Georgetown University. They have some graduation ceremonies, but he's gonna be joining us for lunch. So um, I'm standing in for him, but this first panel um, is a terrific one. We're gonna talk uh, first about South Korean nuclear policy and then the implications for U.S.-South Korean nuclear cooperation. We have three terrific speakers followed by two discussants, and I'm going to just very briefly introduce them. 
Uh, we'll have um, 10 to 15 minutes from each speaker, five to 10 minutes from the discussants, and then we'll open it up to the floor for your questions. So our first speaker is Dr. Sango Sheen, who uh, is with Seoul National University. By the way, you have everyone's bio in your packet. Um, uh, Dr. Sheen has a lot of uh, experience, actually, in U.S. Uh, <laughs> think tanks, uh, both at the East-West Center uh, from the Brookings Institution and uh, IFPA up in Cambridge. Um, and we were last together at a panel in Seoul, I think, uh, at the Asan Institute. He's going to be talking about North Korean nuclear crisis and the South Korean nuclear policy. Um, Dr. Sheen will be followed by... Um, Dr. Bang Gun Jun, who's a professor at the Korean National Diplomatic Academy. Um, and Dr. Jun uh, has um, held a lot of uh, different government in positions inside and outside government. Uh, and you may know him from his work, at the, particularly at the Quito uh, New York headquarters uh, for several years. Following Dr. Jun is Tom Moore, who is the deputy director at the Proliferation Prevention Program. Uh, we're very excited. To, he joined us in March. Um, and for those of you who know him, he was a professional, senior professional staff member on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, has a lot of um, experience dealing with nuclear cooperation agreements, as well as many other uh, defense and security related topics. Following Tom, uh, we have two discussants, Dr. Chae Sung Chun, uh, who is um, also at Seoul National University. He's on the advisory committee for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the Ministry of Reunification. And following Dr. Chun is Will Toby, <laughs> who almost needs no introduction. He's a senior fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Kennedy School of government at Harvard University. And prior to joining Belfer, uh, Will was the deputy administrator for defense nuclear nonproliferation at NNSA, at DOE, as well as having held positions at the National Security uh, Council staff. So I'm going to get out of the way and give the um, floor over to our first speaker, Dr. Shin. Thank you, Sal. Uh, Thank you very much for um, coming into this session in the early morning. Uh, today I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm not going to talk about, by the way, one, two, three agreement. My colleague will talk about it later on. But I'm, this morning I'm going to talk about some uh, kind of, it's not a South Korea nuclear policy per se, it's more like a debate or small controversy. Uh, in the aftermath of North Korea's third nuclear test, that is February. That is, um, there is a small voices, emerging voices maybe, uh, but um, maybe South Korea has to think about our own uh, nuclear development, uh, not in terms of uh, peaceful energy, but in terms of also weapon, as a kind of tip for tat for the North Korea's uh, nuclear uh, program. So uh, it's. My conclusion at the end would be it's, it's not a major opinion uh, or uh, it's, it's a really the major debate in Korea at the moment, but still there's a, some growing concern in the United States about that uh, comment or statement made by some uh, opinion leaders in South Korea. So I'm going to talk about that uh, issue this morning. So, uh, but before that, if I may, I'd like to show you some uh, general uh, public sense about what they, how they perceive about recent no, uh, North Korean uh, nuclear development and uh, also uh, ensuing uh, uh, tension on the Korean Peninsula. So first, uh, this one uh, was done uh, by the Gallup uh, in the, right in the aftermath of North Korea's nuclear test. And as you can see here, this, uh, people say it's, uh, uh, perceive it as a major threat to the Korean Peninsula. And the second line is uh, uh, quite interesting, as many uh, re uh, reporters already talked about it. In the right immediate aftermath of uh, the test, when they asked, so what do you think? Do we have to also think about developing our own nuclear weapon? And 64% said yes. So it, it caused a kind of some alarm bell in, in the, this part of the uh, world. And then uh, the other, uh, some other interesting uh, poll, you can just read, I'm not going to you know, uh, go through all that. 
And the second poll, which was done uh, in the height of uh, uh, kind of nuclear crisis or Korean crisis this March, in the aftermath of a UN resolution against that uh, nuclear test by uh, North Korea, uh, North Korean authority really indeed uh, uh, ratcheted up its uh, war rhetoric, saying that uh, they will again see a fire in uh, Seoul and both Washington. They say the armistice is not uh, effective anymore. It's a war situation, all kinds of war rhetoric. And uh, you may remember really the swaths of foreign reporters were gathering into Seoul looking for some trouble. And at that moment, yes, uh, the first line of many Koreans were worried about uh, there might be a military provocation indeed. 46% uh, says yes, but still 47% says no. And the others uh, you can read it. But and uh, then, then months after, in April uh, this year, again, uh, we also have another uh, s uh, stage of a kind of crisis, which was the Kaesong. Uh, uh, at the time, North Korean authorities uh, decided to withdraw all its labors from Kaesong, practically shutting down the Kaesong Industrial Park, which was, by the way, one of the still the uh, only uh, things that uh, connected both uh, North and South in the midst of all this tension, right? North Korea never touched upon this Kaesong, even during the Lee myung administration, the both government made it, uh, they wanted to keep it as a kind of still last line of defense in this uh, continuing crisis on, uh, between the two uh, Koreas. And after that, uh, again, the people said, but interestingly enough, and. If you uh, remember, previously they said the uh, military provocation, the possibility was 46%. But after months, still they say it cut down to half. Only 24% says uh, there will be a kind of uh, North Korean military provocation. And the next line is quite in interesting. Again, the foreign reporters were talking about as if uh, some you know, kind of military uh, uh, clash uh, imminent. But 95% of Koreans said they haven't prepared for anything for kind of any kind of military trouble. So that was a quite very kind of different situation in the Korean Peninsula. While there is a kind of war concern and rhetoric going on in the United States, people on the Korean Peninsula, especially South Korea, they say it's just a you know, business as usual. North Korea has done it before. I mean, this is again another round of the just rhetoric. We are not uh, ready to pack and leave the country. So this is just a one um, uh, set of uh, things. On the one hand, yeah, they're worried about North Korea's uh, nuclear test. Yet at the same time, the, the sense of these uh, things going on in the Korean Peninsula is quite complicated and, in a way, uh, quite realistic uh, as assessment of uh, situation. So in the in this background, uh, there's uh, some uh, people saying that maybe we should think about developing our own, I mean, the South Korea uh, should, should think about possibility of uh, introducing some kind of nuclear weapon in the, Korea, on, on the part of South. And people like, and that includes some uh, prominent figures like uh, Congressman uh, Jung Mong Joon, who is a seven-term uh, uh, congressman in the governing party. He was a former presidential candidate. Or like a journalist uh, Kim Dae Jung, he is uh, uh, he's like a Korean version of uh, Klaus Hammer, <laughs> uh, so uh, representing very uh, uh, conservative voices in uh, Korean media, and so these people are talking about you know we should think about seriously about uh, arming ourselves uh, as a really uh, kind of our self deterrence against North Korea. And some others also says uh, maybe that's too dangerous, that's way over too much, but still maybe we have to really think about redeploying the uh, tactical nuclear weapon with the Americans, uh, which was withdrawn in the early 90s. And of course the public poll, you know, not only the Gallup poll, also Asan, uh, which is, or by the way, established by the, uh, the congressman M MJ, uh, came up with 66 percent. It's like 70 percent Korean people support for uh, nuclear armament. And the case for uh, this uh, uh, 
nuclear weapon program is like uh, goes like this. First of all, there's a kind of a doubt about the debate about where we can really trust American commitment on this uh, extended nuclear deterrence. And if that we cannot uh, uh, trust, maybe we have to go for our own self uh, deterrence. And also, there's uh, all the other uh, 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 reasoning, such as like it could create more leverage in uh, nuclear negotiation with North Korea, or it could really force U.S. to really commit uh, on its own uh, uh, extended deterrence mm -hmm. over Korea, or even it can force China to, to be much more aggressive and active in this, uh, uh, dissuading North Korea's nuclear program. Those are the, some rational behind those. And I see there are some policies. First of all, about the concern of U.S. nuclear extended deterrence, which was quite controversial during the Cold War in the European front. And I don't think uh, that applies to Korean case because uh, obviously North Korea is not Soviet Union during the Cold War and U.S. I mean, has absolute dominance over this nuclear uh, parity vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. I mean, North Korean nuclear capability, they try to make it uh, you know, the case that they can attack the United States with this success of uh, long-range uh, missile and uh, you know, miniaturizing nuclear uh, warhead, all that. But you know, experts, people believe that still it, it is years, I mean, if not decades away uh, for North Korea from you know, being able to do that, I mean, attack actually the uh, United States with a nuclear weapon. So in that case, simply U.S. doesn't have that kind of uh, dilemma of uh, you know, covering its ally with nuclear deterrence. In fact, it is a quite opposite. If there's anything happen, if really North Korea crossed the red line, we have to, South Korea has to worry about the U.S. willingness to use nuclear weapon over this tiny Korean peninsula, which was uh, uh, emphasized by professors like uh, Scott Sagan at Stanford. So in that case, we don't need extra uh, nuclear uh, you know, or commitment from the U.S. It only damages the alliance partnership. It only creates a more uh, security uh, dilemma by, uh, for example, inducing a nuclear domino, who knows, Japan, Taiwan. And of course, it damages our negotiation leverage with North Korea. North Korea will use it as a more excuse to deepen their, strengthen their nuclear development. Of course, China, I don't think, will be very happy about it. So my conclusion is that uh, the simply the nuclear option at the moment, South Korea, it's not an option. I mean, uh, and th in that sense, uh, it, it's not useful. It doesn't help at all uh, for both South Korea's national security interest and the U.S. Uh, security interest. So in that case, uh, the people who talk about it uh, so often should know better about it. At the same time, the public poll, the 70 percent, I mean, 66 percent or 64 percent about you know public support, it can be also a little bit misleading. I should say. Because, I mean, the way they ask in the aftermath of a nuclear test, any country will come up with the same kind of public opinion if you are in the same kind of position. I mean, it's, it's simply they ask, so do you think we have to develop a nuclear weapon? People will say yes, most of people, under the circumstances. At the same time, if you make the question like a little bit differently, so do you think we have to make a, a develop our nuclear weapon at the expense of US-ROK alliance? I think the answer would be quite different. Or if you do the same poll in, in two months after right now, when people say 95% of Koreans says, I don't worry about war on the Korean Peninsula, it might be quite also different. So I, we, we should be a little bit careful about you know, interpreting those kind of poll uh, or, or opinion uh, by uh, those uh, Korean uh, uh, us. So, Instead, uh, what we have to do is, you know, uh, we have to really build more trust and uh, come up with, uh, you know, uh, a common front in dealing with North Korea's nuclear uh, issue rather than thinking, uh, having a second thought about each other's commitment over this issue. So in that sense, uh, what this uh, uh, new administration, the Park Geun-hye, uh, says uh, trust-based politics or trust politics is really kind of, uh, you know, uh, it strikes a right note at the moment in, in, in this uh, U.S. ROK coordination and co cooperation on 
dealing with nu North Korea's nuclear crisis. On that note, I will stop here, and I will be more than happy to talk more about uh, this issue later on. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll save uh, questions um, un until we've heard from all our speakers and discussants. So now, Bangu, the floor. Thank you. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to share my, my thoughts on this uh, uh, very important issue. Uh, in fact, I, I used to follow North Korea nuclear issue for a long, long time. And uh, that did not end, uh, you know, did not produce good results. <laughs> so, <laughs> 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 and uh, while I was, uh, and then uh, while I was uh, somewhat tired of uh, North Korea nuclear issues, I thought that this, uh, you know, U.S.-Korea nuclear cooperation is, issue could be very interesting. So I picked up a few years ago, and it's not really coming that well so far. <laughs> So I, I hope that uh, I, in, in two years we come up with uh, much better results instead of another extension. Uh, today my topic is uh, uh, U.S.-Korea uh, strategic alliance and how it has its influence on U.S.-ROK nuclear cooperation. That is my issue. And I, I prepared my slide and I will go over. Do I? Okay, uh, the title is uh, uh, Strategic Alliance and the Global Partnership for Nuclear Energy and Non-Proliferation. And uh, I will start with, uh, uh, by raising questions, what is a uh, uh, strategic alliance? Uh, we used this word uh, probably the first time in uh, 2009 when uh, uh, President Lee Myung-bak and uh, President Obama met uh, uh, have a summit uh, in Washington. And uh, they come up with a joint vision for the alliance of the U.S. and ROK in 2009. And uh, it reflects that uh, Korea is uh, a quite a successful uh, uh, economic growth and uh, successful democratization and uh, its, uh, its willingness to go abroad. So the, uh, the alliance, alliance changed its scope, its relationship and its, uh, its uh, fields. So the scope was, it used to be a Korean Peninsula specific, in fact, against North Korea. But now uh, we are expanding to the region and to the globe. And it was, it started with a military alliance, but now we are expanding our field of cooperation to much broader area, including political, economic, social, cultural, even cooperation. And also the relationship used to be a, a unilateral and it, it's a, a tutelage and sponsorship, but now it's a more of a mutually beneficial uh, two-way uh, relationship. And uh, at that there, uh, they said that uh, they, uh, they want to expand uh, their uh, cooperation uh, into the fields of uh, even the uh, civil space cooperation and uh, clean energy security and the peaceful use of, of nuclear energy. But I somewhat doubt that uh, that didn't produce much a concrete result. Since our space program mostly rely on Russian technology, I hope that uh, we could get uh, some, uh, when we are testing rocket, we could uh, you know, borrow or buy uh, US technology. But we the, rely on Russia too. <laughs> you rely on Russia, okay. <laughs> Uh, however, that the uh, that, uh, the cooperation space uh, 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 co civic space program was not quite enough, and uh, I hope that uh, the breakthrough in this uh, uh, nuclear energy field uh, could sp have some spill of effect the civil space cooperation program. And also, they said that, that they are going to uh, ready to deal with a lot of uh, global uh, uh, international and international security issues, including double and proliferation and the human rights issues. And uh, now we have a comprehensive uh, strategic alliance uh, and uh, adding that comprehensive and also a global partnership. That is what uh, we could hear last uh, uh, a few weeks uh, that uh, when the President Park Geun-hye came to Washington and, uh, and made a speech and also they produced uh, in the summit a joint declaration on the commemoration of the 60th anniversary of the alliance. And uh, Korea was uh, quite happy, and, and I expect the U.S. in the same uh, 
have the same feeling that uh, our secret uh, success could produce another a, another life cycle of a, a successful uh, cooperation in, in every field. So here they say that uh, uh, we continue to strengthen to and adapt our alliance to, to serve as a linchpin of peace and stability in the Korea Pacific and to meet the security challenges of the 21st century. So they, they, they brought this alliance into the much wider scope and they want to carry the success into the future. I, I, I think that uh, that means a lot, but however, somehow in Korean journalists, uh, how they are, uh, there was some debate, what is this linchpin and it's different from cornerstone. And uh, <laughs> I don't know how they are different. Uh, uh, it used to be, uh, you know, you know, describing the Japan-U.S. alliance as a linchpin. Now it's uh, they more or less uh, says about the cornerstones. So now people are saying linchpin could be one, and the cornerstone could be a few. So <laughs> I don't know. And the U.S. ROK alliance includes increasing global partnership. So U.S. welcomes ROK's leadership and active engagement in the world on the world stage, including international forum. And uh, they also come up with a lot of uh, 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 fields for the cooperation, including uh, ODA, climate change, energy security, of course, including uh, non-proliferation and the peaceful use of nuclear energy. And then it's not a, 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 a just uh, uh, this strategic, a comprehensive strategic alliance uh, comes out of nowhere. We have a few regions and the evidences and the cases of this uh, uh, very mutually beneficial alliance uh, 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 relationship. That was uh, uh, witnessed at the uh, uh, 2012 uh, Seoul Nuclear, uh, Nuclear, Security Co Cooper Nuc Nuclear Security Summit, I believe. And also, and we are exporting uh, uh, WR uh, light water reactor to UAE. There was, uh, of course, uh, uh, a serious uh, cooperation with the United States. And uh, we are working together at the Six Part Talks. And uh, Korea sent our forces to Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, we are somewhat proud that uh, we are participating in U.S. Uh, anti-terrorism war. And uh, we also, we work somewhat uh, 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 very well known at the beginning as a, a kind of a, the first non-Western uh, forces uh, coming to help the United States. And also we have FTA, and it's uh, uh, last year, and uh, Korea was uh, quite a, a, a strong and active player in a lot of non-proliferation field. And I, I heard that the Korea, the GNC, GICNT, a global initiative to combat nuclear terrorism, the general conference was held a year ago in Seoul, and in Daejeon, and also Korea was uh, taking chairmanship uh, next year. And currently, Korea, Korea is taking the chairmanship of the UN Security Council 1540 Committee. So we are working very closely with the United States and very actively on these issues. And, uh, and uh, also, uh, Korea was uh, supporting in our speech at the, our President Park speech at the Congress that uh, Korea is supporting U.S. Uh, Asia Pacific rebalancing strategy. That shows that uh, we are uh, really ready to work with the United States on various <laughs> issues. And then I'm now going to move that uh, how this uh, U.S.-Korea strategic uh, uh, alliance and the relationship is uh, reflected in our uh, nuclear partnership. Uh, open, I we are hearing that uh, this uh, uh, the goal the goal of uh, uh, U.S. new U.S. ROK. Uh, cooperation agreement or the, this partnership is, is about the getting, especially from the South Korea point of view, to getting uh, ENR technology, enrichment and uh, pyroprocessing or, or enrichment technology. I don't think uh, they are strategic goals. They could be just uh, one element. I, I think uh, we are aiming at the much broader and the much higher strategic goals. Mm -hmm. The goals could be a common commercial interest and uh, when we when we join our uh, comparative edge, we could come up with a much complementary uh, cooperation is possible. And also, uh, we are aiming at the sustainable nuclear energy for stronger uh, energy security by having sustainability of our uh, energy systems. I think we could be uh, uh, contributing to uh, our prosperity. 
And uh, it, that includes not only spent fuel management problem, but also uh, uh, economic and the secure supply of uh, nuclear fuel. And also, while it's not popular in, 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 in the United States, uh, Korea was quite eager to, to have a serious research program on uh, uh, next generation nuclear energy system uh, together with the advanced fuel cycle. And also, we are aiming at the stronger global nuclear non-proliferation security and the safety regimes. Uh, we expect that uh, uh, somehow this uh, global nuclear governance is uh, not uh, uh, strong enough as they used to be. And, uh, and as we are going to have a new competitor and a new entrance uh, led by some you know, uh, new uh, nuclear exporting states, uh, and uh, it could be somehow uh, in the U.S.-Korea role in that field could be uh, beneficial to strengthen and maintain our higher standards of nuclear safety and security and non-proliferation. <coughs> and also in that case, the U.S. could extend its uh, nuclear control through joint export together with uh, us, Korea. And also we are presenting a model, a model to new emerging nuclear power states and also uh, Middle-level, middle-level uh, nuclear power states, and uh, we didn't need we didn't need any ENR capacity until we are uh, uh, we thought that uh, we are having uh, 20 or 20 plus uh, nuclear power plants. So when a country new or newly entering countries are asking for uh, you know nuclear fuel cycle capabilities, uh, you know Korea could be an example that uh, that uh, it could live without them. And also, Korea has been showing very strong uh, uh, international compliance and cooperation. Uh, and so we, we are showing a model to any of these uh, new entering or, or mid-level uh, nuclear power uh, states, nuclear power generating states. And here I want to present that when we assess the success or lack of success of a U.S.-Korea nuclear partnership, we need to apply uh, multiple criteria instead of only one criteria. I think, I think uh, those criteria could be peace, uh, prosperity, environment, uh, safety, and security. And, uh, and uh, you know, when we are coming to a certain field, we tend to have a one, a very narrow focus. But uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, national security or, or international interest or, or global interest, we could apply much wider uh, criteria. So I better uh, skip this. So when I'm saying environment, it includes the waste management and the climate change. These are also very serious issues. And when I say peace criteria, it includes non-proliferation, nuclear security issues. And also this uh, prosperity criteria is also very important uh, when we are having much uh, a weaker economy. And, uh, and uh, this economics and job creation by exporting nuclear power plants could be another benefit of uh, having cooperation. And here is what the, then the President Park said on uh, ROK-US nuclear cooperation. I thought it's a, a little bit lengthy. I have this uh, full quotation of, from her remarks. She used to say in her uh, presidential election pledge that uh, we need to revise the outdated uh, ROK-US uh, <coughs> nuclear cooperation agreement. And also, uh, when she was here, she, she made a speech to Congress. There she said that uh, Korea has been using peaceful use of nuclear energy, and now we need a modernized, mutually beneficial successor to all the existing nuclear agreement. And also, this is uh, something new that I saw uh, the other day at the Korean press when she was making, having a press conference uh, in Seoul. She said that I, we be, I believe that the current agreement is not equitable or fair since it was made when we had no nuclear power plants. Therefore, revision in a modernized and mutual beneficial way would also help strengthen our alliance. The new agreement should be able to address the spent fuel management problem urgently, secure stable supply of uh, uh, fuel, and to strengthen our nuclear export competitiveness. And also she added that I said, I told uh, President Obama as such, and he shared uh, my understanding and the these understandings. There was uh, what she said uh, uh, to the Korean press. 
Then what Korea wants uh, through uh, ENR capacity acquiring? I said I present a few criteria and also strategic goals here. Am I have just a few minutes? One. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just ask that, uh, uh, that we are not seeking status, prestige, or military security, but economics. It's all about economics, energy security, and environment, and the export competitiveness. Uh, so also, we are not demanding a special exceptional treatment to our needs, but we want a fair and equitable treatment. That's what I'm asking. And also, Korea is not a Japan, not an India, not a Euratom, but we need a unique uh, Korean-specific, Korea-US uh, uh, cooperation model. It's uh, something new. It may take time to make uh, new ideas, but uh, uh, we need a new cooperative model. Uh, when we do pursue this, so we have certainly some uh, obstacles, those uh, uh, nuclear sovereignty, nuclear <coughs> armament issues that has been raised. I'm going to skip that. And, uh, and uh, here is uh, what the Korea cannot, and we lack uh, nuclear. And uh, here is a summary. Uh, the success of a nuclear energy program results from two factors in Korea, a U.S.-Korea nuclear cooperation and the Korea decision to solely pursue a civilian nuclear energy program. I think uh, we need to carry that success story to the world and to the future. And the new expanded U.S.-Korea nuclear cooperation under the Strategic Alliance and Global Partnership would help the U.S. increase its commercial gains acquire all the benefits of a joint research while averting risks and the costs of otherwise, and, it, and to expand its nuclear control to new important, important countries, and to maintain high nuclear standards globally and to compete with other and to contain other less <coughs> compliant states. And also I'd like to argue that the multifaceted benefits bilaterally and globally of the new uh, cooperation, nuclear cooperation, at the, should not be underestimated and penalized by a single criteria of non-proliferation and also by an old and prejudiced image of uh, old Korea in the 70s. And I better uh, stop there and also I want to uh, suggest a couple of uh, uh, ideas and uh, some of the <coughs> joint studies uh, to have a much better understanding of each other. And uh, we have uh, so far very high level uh, strategic uh, idea about how both countries should behave and should cooperate. But I don't think that that kind of, that kind of a cooperative spirit uh, it come down to the uh, specific issues of a nuclear uh, field. So I think uh, we need uh, how uh, that kind of a, a, a high level a, a cooperative agreement uh, is, uh, should be reflected in our, uh, each of our issues that uh, we are dealing with here. Mm -hmm. I better stop there. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks, Ban Gun. Uh, next, we're going to turn to Tom Moore for a U.S. perspective. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for uh, let me speak this morning, Sharon. Uh, I'm going to give you a sort of abbreviated set of my remarks so that we can move to what I'm sure is going to be a really good set of discussion and uh, questions. Um, by way of just quick introduction, I was the staff member for Senator Luger on the Foreign Relations Committee for 10 years that had to deal with uh, 123 agreements under Section 123 of the Atomic Energy Act. I'm not going to be talking today about uh, a lot of how Congress will proceed now to consider an extension with South Korea. A aside from saying that Congress will have a role uh, and it will need to pass some sort of statutory uh, relief for the administration if it wants that done uh, before the current agreement expires next year. And my understanding is those discussions are in a very early set of uh, talks and I, I, I don't really want to discuss them because I don't have to anymore. Um, so let me just say with regard to generally peaceful civilian nuclear trade, I don't think there are any American policy and lawmakers that don't support the negotiation and maintenance of American nuclear cooperative agreements with every nation with which we now have those agreements, and I'd say including and particularly with the Republic of Korea. Now, as everyone here knows, and it's been said, the United States decided to seek an extension of the current 123 agreement with the South to 2016 in order to give negotiators more time to address the issue on which agreement seemed unlikely before it expired. Now, Sharon and I noted in a piece we did for our proliferation program blog that uh, this isn't necessarily a solution. Uh, and I'd point out that in 2016 in the United States, we'll be in another election cycle. 
Uh, by 2016, it's likely we'll have seen how events in Iran have either positively or negatively influenced perceptions regarding the durability and credibility of the NPT, which has its next review conference in 2015. And coming back to my old haunt, Congress will also have to consider other 123 agreements in the next three years, much of which, or two of which, and big ones are Taiwan and China, and those are in the same region with South Korea. Now, I think my colleagues' slides and presentations all provide a very good, excellent summary as to why U.S.-South Korean civilian nuclear cooperation attracts uh, appropriate and a lot uh, more attention than we have in other agreements. I can't think of another spot on the map or another agreement in the 123 agreement area that we have with anybody where we have the potential to make uh, more interesting and more meaningful choices for how nuclear cooperative agreements are going to be perceived coming down the line with other countries. Now, I think the summit, the Park Obama summit, was a success in that regard because negotiation of our bilateral terms for peaceful cooperation by dint of the decision to defer became neither about South Korea's past nor about North Korea's present nuclear weapons programs. I think this was an entirely sensible decision made jointly by the Park and Obama administrations, and it was a very tricky thing to manage given the penchant for political overstatement reflected in the press on the agreement. Now, from an American perspective, I think it's certainly reassuring that President Park agreed to this path as it took this issue out of the zero-sum perspective and provided ability for us to step back and acknowledge our, uh, our alliance's linchpin or cornerstone uh, unique and enduring nature. I'd leave it at that. I don't work at the State Department, so I don't have to come up with <laughs> new terms for alliances every three weeks, but we do have one. Uh, and that seems good enough for me in plain English. Uh, but the decision to defer doesn't solve the problem leading to it, which is, I think, most everyone here is familiar with, and that's that the United States has resisted to provide its consent to further process our material in South Korea. And the question now is whether we ought to create an exception for South Korea to our longstanding policy that restricts broad, programmatic, not specific consents to alter and form and content our material to Japan, Uratom, and India. And as I said at the beginning of my remarks, your perspective on that question varies as to whether you think this agreement will have direct import for future agreements that might come down the road. So let me just say in extremis, there are two very strong views in the United States as far as I can tell. One suggests strongly that creating such an exception would do tremendous harm as it would detract from efforts to prevent the spread of enrichment and reprocessing to new, new, reprocessing to new nations and, based on the experience of other nations, would likely not result in cooperation that would benefit South Korea in the long run. Another view suggests the United States ought to acknowledge our allies' ambitions and proceed with cooperation that would enable the South to develop, possess, and market nuclear technology to include permission to further process American materials in South Korea and to cooperate on all aspects of the nuclear fuel cycle. The administration has generally, and I say generally because I don't know where its policy review has ended up, decided that when considering whether or not to give consent to alter and form and content American materials, the United States will do so on a, quote, case-by-case -case basis, rather than apply a uniform standard to all new agreements for cooperation. That uniform standard, or gold standard, would mirror the approach taken in the 2009 agreement with the United Arab Emirates, which, as my friend Ambassador Tom Graham wrote in 2009, codifies unprecedented steps the UAE is taking to prevent proliferation. The Amirati decision was not to develop or possess facilities for the enrichment or reprocessing of material in UAE, but to send its spent nuclear fuel abroad. President Obama, in his submission of that agreement to uh, Congress, was quite specific that, quote, the United States and the UAE are entering into this in the context of a stated intention by the UAE to rely on existing international markets for nuclear fuel services as an alternative to the pursuit of enrichment and reprocessing. Article 7 will transform this UAE policy into a legally binding obligation from the UAE to the United States upon entry into force. Now, let me just depart here for a second and say something that, at least in my observation, not too many people have noticed. South Korea is already a gold standard country. By dint of the Joint Direct Relation of 1992, South Korea has said it will not possess enrichment or reprocessing facilities on its peninsula. It has an additional <laughs> protocol with the IAEA and a full scope safeguards agreement. By any measure, South Korea is already a gold standard state. And I'd further point out that the only other country with which it has substantial nuclear cooperation is the United Arab Emirates, which also is the original gold standard state in its agreement. 
So to the extent that we consider that going forward, and I hope today we'll talk more about that, how can we improve on that leadership uh, and how can we make sure that whatever we decide in the future doesn't detract from it given this unique trilateral relationship? Now, the UAE agreement reflected desire over the course of both the Bush and Obama administrations to send messages to countries in the Middle East that when a nation pursues nuclear power in a responsible matter, the United States is willing to cooperate. Now, at that time, responsible pursuit is generally taken to mean that facilities for enrichment and reprocessing aren't necessary, as President Bush said in 2004, for the enjoyment of peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Now, the decision to defer with South Korea ought to allow us to be a lot more reasonable than we have heretofore seen public comment allow. It's worth reiterating the position the United States has consistently taken. We are prepared to jointly cooperate and evaluate fuel cycle technologies with the South in the United States. Now, there's more in this offer than might be appreciated. Uh, in my own view, facilities for the production of special nuclear material in regions of instability ought to be seen as strategic facilities since they are, whether during in crisis or peacetime, facilities of special interest to neighboring states. To the extent that any two such countries are allies of this country, even if the building and operating of such facilities presents no problem to the United States, it could to another country in that region. To the extent that our foreign policy would become complicated by latent or explicit antagonism between or among our allies, the United States must walk a careful line that does not create situations wherein it might face the incredibly difficult task of being seen as siding with one over another, particularly when nuclear threats are made. Now, our offer to continue cooperation with the South outlined above takes into account much more than North Korea. It's a refined and careful policy that reflects a painstaking calibration of many decades. The test of American resolve against North Korea cannot and must not now be measured by whether North Korea has or retains nuclear weapons. Equally important, our strength of commitment to the South ought not to be measured on the narrow ground in, of all things, programmatic consent, as I think my colleagues have alluded to. But if we are to navigate our way through the next two years together with our ally, then we ought to understand that we should never let our bilateral nuclear cooperation be framed as either too permissive by our common foes, nor mislabeled as unfair. To the extent the South is now an exemplar of the things that we would want other countries to do, and does not possess things that we have heretofore persuaded people to forego, we ought to leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Uh, we will now turn to our discussants. Dr. Chun, first. Thank you. <clears throat> While well, I try to uh, address one question uh, to each presenters. First to uh, Professor Shin, uh, he talked about South Korea public's response to uh, mainly from North Korea provocations and how we should prepare for uh, the further provocations. And there is, it's true that there is a, a public opinion which uh, claims that we have to go to the uh, nuclear armaments, that's, that's fine. But, you know, I think every specialist or the government officials know that uh, it is not an option because it, entails a lot of, you know, disastrous results coming from uh, that kind of option. But it's, it's, it's a true fact among the public. It's an emotional response to North Korea provocations, especially in the first half of this year. Uh, it's emotional uh, and also, but it, it's, uh, uh, I'm not saying it is, is unworthy, you know. Uh, it's a response to North Korea provocations that we should do something. Uh, and uh, we should be prepared by having a better options to cope with North, North Korea provocations. So what should we do? Uh, you know, uh, first thing is that we have to prepare for a very rational North Korean nuclear policies with uh, a very coordinated stance with the United States. If we have a very good development in dealing with North Korea diplomatically, then I think uh, not just South Korean public, but also many people will think that uh, this kind of option will not be uh, a very a effective. So the question is always combined with our uh, coordinated, very effective policy toward the North. Uh, the second thing is that, well, uh, in dealing with nuclear cooperation, uh, the U.S. officials or new U.S. specialists, it's very natural, but uh, they say that uh, this kind of public opinion is not a good factor in uh, going for the nuclear cooperation between the two countries. Uh, I think this should, 
these two issues should be uh, delinked. This, this is not really a uh, linkage issue. So uh, we just hope that United States will say to the South Korean public maybe that there will be a very uh, steady and strong stance for extended deterrence to South Korean public. Uh, nuclear cooperation uh, is, is another issue. Uh, so we have to be very rational in dealing with this issue. Uh, so there, there should be some rationale or the contents to uh, South Korean public. How can we deal with this issue? So uh, uh, comments and question to Professor Shin is, uh, what kind of message should we prepare for the South Korean public with a, a good plan uh, for uh, preparing for the North Korean provocations? Uh, okay, second to Professor Chun. Uh, it's more complex, and also uh, the same question to uh, Dr. Moore, the same question. When I'm, not, I'm not a really specialist about nuclear energy or nuclear science. I'm a political scientist. But when I look at all the process of negotiating uh, for the renewal of the, of the treaty, uh, very interestingly, uh, we have very complex situation in which different actors inside one country have different interests. For example, uh, we have four actors, I think, uh, the government officials from foreign ministry uh, who are very much uh, strategically oriented. The second is nuclear scientists, a, uh, who has a very strong value for the global non-proliferation, and nuclear industry people who are motivated by economic interests mainly, and the public, uh, South Korean public, for example, they have very strong nationalist feelings that we have to be very sovereign in dealing with these issues. Uh, for both South Korea and the United States, they have some problems in aggregating their uh, national interests, which should, should result in the concept of national interest. So if you look at textbook type of definition of national interest, it's very hard to find one national interest because you know national interest is just a concept in which there are many different uh, ideas of sectoral interests. Uh, it's a democracy. So this long process of negotiation, I think it's a very good learning process for South Korea and also the United States that uh, we have to uh, go through sometimes painful but uh, very necessary process of aggregating all these uh, sector interests, which should be very effective in consolidating, uh, as uh, uh, Prof. John said, a comprehensive alliance. So we should set this problem from the perspective of a comprehensive alliance. So if we have some, uh, this delay of the negotiations for two years, I think we will have more learning process. How can we combine a different sector's interest into a one national interest? The second thing is that uh, now uh, the negotiators are the, the officials of the foreign ministry. Uh, they have a lot of burdens. And I, I don't think they can deal with all the problems and issues in a, a, a very short period of time. And uh, if we want to develop this alliance into a more comprehensive, you know, the comprehensive alliance based on common values, then there should be more multi-layered contact among the uh, different players, for example, scientists to scientists, uh, you know, security officials and security uh, specialists to security officials in two, uh, in two countries. That, that is a real uh, concept of, of model alliance for the 21st century, but we lack uh, that kind of you know, multi-layered uh, process of uh, cooperation and negotiations, which will uh, put more burdens to the uh, negotiating government officials for uh, two countries. If you look back upon the process of FTA negotiations, that's also belong to a, the concept of comprehensive alliance because we think that FTA has some security external externalities in uh, both countries. If we don't do uh, the FTA negotiations uh, effectively, then there is also a voice uh, in both countries that we have to renegotiate the agreement, which is very, uh, unfortunate situation to, uh, to the countries. And also, uh, there is a, the problem of burden sharing after the FTAs for different sectors of the society. So if we cannot complete the negotiations for one to three agreement, uh, then there will be that kind of thing uh, happening. So we have to uh, be very careful and deal with this uh, negotiating process from the perspective of the comprehensive alliance. And also, 
uh, it was 40 years of the uh, duration for the for the initial treaty but as you know the situation changes very quickly we might have a technical uh, leeway to deal with a cha very rapidly changing situations for example we can uh, shorten the period of duration the, uh, of, of the treaty as so that we can reform uh, or adjust to the changing uh, situations. And also for South Korea, I think, uh, you know, we have, uh, we are still a relatively weak country in the region, but uh, the national power is growing. That's also a fact. So we have a very different self image or self perception of our roles. Uh, so we want more, a South Korean public. But it's also true that we have to have more responsibilities as a, these days, a middle power a kind of diplomacy. So uh, in terms of nuclear cooperation uh, issue, we have to define this issue from very different perspectives, such as South Korea's role or responsibilities for the global non-proliferation, and then uh, think about our uh, different, you know, differing some claims for uh, South Korea's uh, future. So. Uh, actually, this is comment, but uh, I is, is thankful to hear some comments from the presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chen. We're going to turn the mic over to Will, Toby. Oh, do you? Can I ask you to answer some of that, or would you like me to intervene? Well, what do you think, panelists? Would you like to uh, <laughs> respond now or wait until after Will's? Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with this, this terrific panel. Um, my impression is that if the negotiations were turned over to them, it would be solved relatively quickly. Um, I drew four observations and a hope from what I heard this morning. And the first was that strategic interests should be paramount. Too often in these negotiations, they sort of get hung up on, on details. And I think all of the speakers were admirable in their adherence to the importance of strategic interests, peace, prosperity, security, environmental protection. The second conclusion I drew was that an independent ROK nuclear deterrent is not the answer to the problems, that um, conventional deterrence remains strong, that extended deterrence is the ultimate guarantor, and my own personal belief is that the ROK will prevail over the DPRK the only questions that are remaining are when and at what cost. So it's up to us to try and shape the answers to those questions. And in part, the policies being discussed this morning will affect that. Third, that U.S. ROK civil nuclear cooperation greatly benefits both countries. Professor June's list of both current um, activities and potential new ones I thought was most effective in bringing home that point. And then fourth, the hope. My hope is that as the ROK's global interests broaden and deepen, and there's no doubt that they are in terms of trade and other issues, that the US and Korean perspectives on this matter will converge. The enrichment and reprocessing problem is not about the ROK, but about the precedent that um, as Korea and as Seoul increases its standing as a nuclear leader, it will be an example for others, and the precedent will be sought. And so it's very important to the United States that we find an answer to this that both meets uh, South Korea's strategic interests in terms of economic competitiveness and environmental protection uh, and energy security, but also in ways that help to shape the environment outside of East Asia. And as um, Seoul's both roles and responsibilities outside of East, East Asia increase, uh, I think that that will be of greater concern to the ROK government. Um, the spread of enrichment and reprocessing would ver likely, very likely hurt um, the ROK at least as much as it would the United States. And in fact, I noted that uh, Professor June's uh, prescription um, for, for examples would uh, minimize that. So I think that that recognition is already there. The question is, are there ways in which we can creatively um, cooperate between the two countries uh, that would 
advance these objectives simultaneously? I think that there probably are in terms of guarantees of uh, availability of enriched uranium to ensure that our OK nuclear power plants continue in operation. I'd note parenthetically that no nuclear power plant has ever ceased operation because of fuel was not available. Similarly, I think in, in, um, in fossil fuel, um, there could be more cooperation, which would help to, to increase um, energy security. The United States is very likely going to go from an energy um, importer to an energy exporter in the next five to ten years. That will dramatically change world energy markets and allows for some flexibility in terms of uh, perhaps long-term um, contracts that might be available to the ROK for natural gas. Um, so I guess with that, I would um, offer a question also to each of the panelists. Uh, to Professor Sheen, um, does extended deterrence remain um, uh, credible and in the ROK, and are there ways to strengthen it? To Professor June, um, if it could be proven that closing the fuel cycle were not economic, would the ROK choose not to pursue that as a policy end? And to Tom Moore, um, are there ways in which we could improve the fuel security and economic competitiveness interests of the ROK while achieving our nonproliferation interests? All right, thank you, Will. Um, Dr. Sheen, do you, would you like to start first yes. with Dr. Uh, Chun's question? By the way, you were asking, so what, what else can be done to make you sure that extended deterrence or? First, is it, is it does it remain still credible? Yes. In, in okay, and sure, sure. Are there things to strengthen? Right. Yeah, I, th I think my short answer to you is uh, yes. I do think uh, the extended uh, deterrence uh, by U.S. over South Korea is very quite credible at the moment. So the problem is that uh, the South Korean public doesn't really, I mean, there's not enough enlightened uh, information. Uh, there's lots of misinformation about this extended deterrence uh, on the South Korean media or forum. So. It is connected to Professor John's question, what can be done to make sure that uh, there will be no such a kind of unnecessary discussion of uh, South Korea going for its own independent nuclear option? Uh, f first one is, yes, uh, you have to uh, have uh, more enlightened and uh, clear uh, information about all this issue. Uh, it's what one of the problem is a very technical issue, so it's, it's not that easy for, you know, uh, average people to understand all this, what is extended. I mean, as was the case during the Cold War, but it's very clear and simple. In case of Korea, Korea is not the, uh, you know, West Germany during the uh, so, uh, Cold War. So the uh, media can play certain role, or uh, uh, the intellectual community can play certain role to give uh, accurate uh, status uh, you know, information about what is the uh, U.S. extended deterrence of uh, Korean Peninsula, which is quite firm and solid, I do think. And there is also, for example, redeployment of uh, you know, U.S. Uh, tactical nuclear missile. For simply the fact that is the U.S. doesn't have tactical nuclear missile these days. I mean, there are only a few hundred left in you know, uh, Europe and in here. So simply there's no tactical nuclear missile that can be brought back into South Korea at the moment. So, those kind of uh, uh, information is also need to be disseminated in, in the Korean public. But I think bottom line is uh, f when we talk about South Korea uh, going for its own nuclear capability, I would say it should be simply, I mean, it's just, it's not a nuclear option for South Korea. It is North Korea option for South Korea. <laughs> Is it, do you want to be no, another North Korea for South Korea? I mean, if you ask a good question to the Korean public, they will definitely say no. I mean, our economy, our political system, all situation is it the very opposite of North Korean situation at the moment. So North Korean option is not for the South Korea. Uh, uh, so that's one thing. And the second thing, uh, then what, uh, should still, if there is a concern about South Korean public about this North Korea's nuclear issue, 
maybe from now on we should uh, frame it uh, not only as a nuclear issue. It is more about, again, it's North Korean problem. Yes, uh, it is more and more uh, clear that uh, it is quite unlikely that current North Korean regime will simply give up nuclear weapon in near future. So if you just uh, stick to only to the nuclear uh, problem, the, the future or answer to that looks quite, you know, uh, gloomy. So if you, so that is one of the reasons why some of these people who talk about this uh, nuclear op independent nuclear option saying that they say U United States is not interested in the nuclearization of North Korea anymore. So that's why we have to think about another option. No, that's not the case. We should uh, uh, emphasize that both U.S. and uh, South Korea still uh, the basic objective uh, is denuclearization of North Korea, and for that matter, denuclearization of the whole Korean Peninsula. But to just focus on nuclear issue makes it very difficult case for both government uh, that there is a you know, uh, uh, near-term solution on that. We have to acknowledge that it's, it's not that near-term solution. Maybe we have to think about the more medium, long-term perspective, and which we have to make a much more comprehensive uh, discussion and coordination and cooperation that in dealing with North Korean problem, it's not just a North Korean nuclear problem anymore because the North Korea's nuclear problem is very much uh, uh, closely connected to the, the nature of the regime and the fate of the regime uh, in the future. So we need to make the things a little bit more broadened and that we have to have a more comprehensive dialogue on that issue. Can I just ask a follow-up question? And that is, you know, the Asan Institute polls in, have been um, criticized by some because of where they come from, right? So, <laughs> um, but, but the Gallup polls show similar results. Um, and my question is, are there polls that have been done in Korea which may not be available in the English language, but that might be more nuanced on this? Because it seems to me that I agree entirely. It completely depends on what question you ask uh, as to the response you get. And I would almost, I would take issue with how you frame that, which is, do you want to be another North Korea? That's kind of an extreme formulation of the question. There may be, there's a lot of gray in between there, right? So, so my question is just, are there other polls available? Is this something that, you know, the NGO community could, could actually work on is getting more nuanced polls out there? Because one of the questions I would ask is, you know, if getting nuclear weapons meant, you know, you're pulling out of the nuclear non-proliferation treaty, you might not become North Korea, clearly, but you're going to, take a hit in terms of your prestige uh, and standing in the world community. I, so I just put those questions. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, not that I know of. I, I tried to dig up some, if there is a, any other poll other than Asan. So I came up with this Gallup yeah. poll. But other than that, I, I haven't found any more nuanced uh, you know, uh, poll on this issue. So we were talking by ourselves, maybe the EAI or some other, yeah. Uh, we should do the, some that kind of more nuance to poll, or in uh, some other time. Is if you just like you said, if you just do that in the aftermath of nuclear test by North Korea, everybody will say yes. I mean, no matter what. <laughs> so maybe yes, uh, that's maybe our responsibility. I mean, the government or some other think tank mm -hmm. to come up with more balanced uh, view or reflection of Korean perception on this issue. Bangun, do you would you like to comment yeah, uh, on the questions? Yes, I have uh, quite a few comments to add. Uh, I, I begin with this uh, nuclear sovereignty and uh, nuclear armament claims in Korea. And uh, this 1991 into Korean denuclearization declaration resulted in some resentment in Korea that produced uh, uh, nuclear sovereignty claimed since then. And uh, North Korea nuclear armament uh, certainly and the threat uh, produced uh, this uh, nuclear armament claimed in South Korea. It's, uh, so they are pretty much uh, reactive <coughs> at first beginning. And also somehow I felt uh, 
it's uh, a little bit unfortunate that uh, we didn't have enough uh, a public dialogue on the what is uh, nuclear armament means to us. At the at the at the public level, you know, to people who are speaking to the public that uh, we have to go nuclear armament. When I read all of them, they say nothing, anything about uh, any of these uh, 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 negative points of going armament. What they say is it's all about prestige and and the status and and. But uh, you know, when I talk to the people, students, uh, and I have uh, just asked them, you know, are you, you are ready to go to nuclear? They said maybe 50, 60 percent say yes. But when I said only five minutes, uh, what kind of price we have to pay, and what kind of uh, you know international non-proliferation we are living in, they change their minds. And uh, despite the lack of this uh, public dialogue on the what is good or bad about this. But uh, however, the government has, our Korea government has the one of the strongest and one of the most robust non-proliferation security, security regime in, in the whole world. And uh, we have, uh, I, 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 I will not go over one by one, but uh, we have uh, the most stringent uh, uh, this uh, uh, non-proliferation regime. So it's, uh, it's uh, and, and also one of the most uh, open and transparent uh, uh, budget and the governmental processes. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not possible. And uh, Toby, you said that, uh, uh, Mr. Toby, the, the precedent effect, uh, Korea could give some bad, you know, send bad message to other countries. But the kind of message that I'm thinking was that Korea has been one of the most uh, uh, a good and excellent uh, a, a partner of the United States. And uh, we have been the most uh, loyal, uh, uh, compliant to global non-proliferation regime. Then Korea was uh, still remaining such a lower level. Give, may give uh, some you know, wrong message to other countries who are trying to enter this uh, nuclear energy world. Since they have choices you know, in previous years, uh, you know, they didn't have choice, but now there is other competitors like Russia, China, India, and they can sell anything without any of the constraint that the U.S. is imposing. So that uh, when the U.S. was uh, still opening or closing the Korea's door to the, a, a much a greater uh, nuclear technology requirement, uh, I think uh, that's going to give another you know, wrong message to the world. And uh, finally, if this uh, uh, closing fuel cycle is uh, turned out to be uh, not economical, then Korea will choose not to pursue. Uh, here is the uh, problem that uh, you have uh, your own criteria of judging what is economical and what is not. And uh, Korea, since we have uh, such a, a extreme high, extremely uh, vulnerable energy security problem. We are importing 97% of our energy from abroad. So people are ready to pay extra money to secure our strength, to surrender our energy security. So we may have some different uh, criteria of calculation of uh, what is the economics of uh, uh, energy security. Uh, but however, if it's really, the, it's not economical, I don't think a Korean government or a business is going to put their money you know, when they saw a Japanese model, you know, no one is uh, seeking Japanese model. Korea is uh, looking for something new model. We don't know precisely how it's going to be turned out, but Korea want to pursue R&D of that model. That is what they want. And the, the later decision of commercialization, I think uh, that is uh, totally up to our own, you know, rational economic calculations. That, uh, yeah, Korea are very, Korean people are very much Economic, so we know we follow money. We don't follow just any, you know, you know empty status. <laughs> uh, well, thanks for asking me the hardest question, Will. Um, <laughs> are there ways to improve fuel security and cooperation in the South while achieving our non-proliferation interests? I'm really glad, and I think he did it intentionally, that uh, June spoke before me. Uh, or at least that's the way that Will wanted the questions answered, because I was listening very carefully to those remarks. And two important things came out of them that I think I'd want to highlight. One was when Jun said, we don't want what Japan has, i.e. that fuel cycle. Uh, we want something new and different. 
Uh, whether this is pyrochemical separations or not, we clearly, between June and I, don't know what that might be just yet, uh, which gets me right back to where I started on the U.S. offer, which is that we would conduct a joint evaluation for 10 years because we don't know what we can deploy on a lab scale or even, as you just said, commercially for some time. But you also said something extremely important, which is the notion that you are dependent on foreign suppliers for virtually all of your energy needs. I don't know that domestic enrichment, based on my understanding of the market and the way utility providers purchase it, um, some of the work I've done here at the center and some of the things I've heard, and also when I was on the Hill, doesn't convince me that there's a strong economic case in South Korea's case to want to pursue enrichment. That said, we already have assurance of uranium supply to you in our existing agreement. No one is saying we would go back on that for any reason. And as we've all repeated over and again, you are, I think, a gold standard country. The South has much uh, non-proliferation credibility on which it can rest an extremely powerful case against its neighbor and put its credentials up against anybody else in the world in that regard right now. So to Will's question, uh, yes, there are certainly things we can do. Uh, when it comes to the assurance of supply, there are a lot of things the Bush administration talked about for countries that we could offer so that they wouldn't need to pursue their own enrichment and reprocessing. But I think we've got to unpack, now that we've unpacked successfully on this panel, this issue from our broader strategic alliance and that we not narrowly focus on programmatic consent. I think that was the consensus we just got out of this panel this morning, which was progress. I think we need to then focus on, so what are the next steps, either through a joint evaluation over the next 10 years we could undertake to agree on criteria for what is economic in South Korea and what is not. And I hope that today this uh, group, all of you, will focus more on that question. Uh, because I'm not going to pretend to know that I know all the answers to Will's question, uh, nor am I going to step into some pretty dicey areas as I already have. But I think all of us by the end of the day will have a better idea of what those criteria for what is and is not economic in the case of South Korea for spent fuel management and for the production of fuel might look like and I'm going to be listening carefully. I'd like to, um, well, first of all, do, do discussants, do you feel like your questions have been answered? <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> Uh-oh. I was more did you satisfied. Or at least you were more satisfied. satisfied. I don't think Dr. So, so did, was there a follow-up or, or something that you wanted to uh, pull no, out from our speakers here? The, the questionnaire, the, the, the South Korea's public, I think it's, we have to do another questionnaire maybe from EI. But the other one is after the uh, Fukushima incident, there was a questionnaire about should we continue our nuclear uh, energy development? And more than half of the South Korean public that we should be nuclear-free country. But still, there is a very strong support for nuclear energy still. But So it's, it's about uh, it's very much event driven. So how we ask questions and and uh, you know the respondents tend to uh, you know the answer the questions only based on that questionnaire rather than having the overall knowledge. Okay, so I think our panel is in violent agreement that we should we need more research, <laughs> <laughs> at least and more nuanced research in terms of what the public cares about. Um, I would just like to make, I guess, one or two points on this assurance of supply. I know I'm going to speak later, so uh, um, Tom made the point about enrichment, right? The assurance of supply is basically connected to South Korea's nuclear exports and providing for low enriched uranium. There are a lot of things that countries do for that. Uh, you know, the U.S., I think, gets 97 percent of its enrichment from overseas. <laughs> not domestic, right? And Korea gets a, a lot of enrichment from China. It's diversified its sources. The same way that the UAE has, actually. Uh, you know, it put out, even though Korean nuclear fuel is going to be doing the fuel fabrication for the, f the four reactors, uh, it's getting enriched uranium supply from Urenco, from Rosatom, from um, Arriva. So that's one way um, that you can do more assurance of supply. The question of uh, Korean domestic enrichment really relies on um, economics. If you're going to rely on economics, then you have to make a case somehow that you can do this cheaper than anybody else, either with your own domestic technology 
or with uh, a black boxed Urenco technology. The other fact of the matter, frankly, is that we have excess capacity in enrichment, so <laughs> worldwide. So, um, you know, and enrichers typically do not even uh, expand their cascades until they have signed contracts for that enriched supply. So I think it's, um, you know, it's a very sm small market. It, it, the uranium enrichment is only $5 billion a year. Uh, so in terms of looking at export competitiveness in general, I think there's been a lot more made of what nuclear exports may mean to South Korea uh, than what it may actually produce for South Korea, even if you had a full nuclear fuel cycle. Because uh, the nuclear renaissance, I mean, it's happening in Asia, but not much else elsewhere. And so uh, one thing I wanted to highlight is, um, and several people here in this room participated in this, we did a workshop in Seoul on Korea as a responsible nuclear exporter. I think copies of that report are outside uh, with the Asan Institute. And it was a really interesting discussion because we had some industry folks in the room. And uh, even they said that, you know, these ideas of, of you know, Korea capturing 20 percent of the market, 80, exporting 80 nuclear power reactors uh, in the next couple of decades is um, a little bit beyond what what is reasonable. Um, I, I'm sorry I've taken so long. I want to open the floor to questions. Uh, please identify yourself and um, keep it brief. We have microphones right up front here. Right up front here, thanks. And then Larry. Second one is. Hi, I'm Jin Seok Bae from EAI. Uh, I would like to mention about the, the interpreting of the public opinion survey result on the, the nuclear weapon argument. Uh, as I understand, the, the nuclear weapon program with our own uh, the weapon and the U.S. ROK alliance cannot be compatible, as I understand. But as I understand, uh, many Koreans believe that they can be compatible. According to the, our recent uh, the survey conducted by East Asia Institute, about 77 uh, people supported that uh, the maintaining U.S. ROK alliance is favorable to the South Korean security. It's very interesting. Uh, so some people, uh, according to the, the Asan Institute, actually 67% believe that we should have our own nuclear weapon. But 77% people believe that the U.S. ROK alliance is favorable, favorable to the, our own self uh, security problem. So uh, my understanding is like this. Uh, the many South Korean pe uh, people doesn't have enough information about the consequence of the, uh, our own nuclearization and the rely on, uh, alliance of the ROK US. So my first comment is like this. And the second one is uh, related to the questionnaire. Uh, About 95 95% Koreans believe that South Korea and North Korea should be, be unified. But another survey uh, indicates very interesting result. About 70% believe that we should have time to reunify uh, at least after 10 years. So this case can be applied to the, the Asan Institute's questionnaire. Uh, yeah, we ought to believe that uh, many Koreans ought uh, must have our own uh, nuclear weapon on the response to the uh, North Korean threat. But the questionnaire, if we have the more specific and sophisticated questionnaire, we will have very different picture of the, the opinion. I, think. I don't, was there a question in there? Mm -hmm. Just a comment. Thanks. All right, let's take another question right in the middle. Thank you. 
CSISF. Japan was mentioned only in passing, uh, but to Dr. Sheen, I've been following the very critical South Korean responses to the statements by Prime Minister Abe that he would favor Japan responding to North Korean nuclear warheading by Japan developing long-range military strike capabilities, and also his stated priorities that he and his allies will make a real push to amend the Japanese Constitution, including Article 9. And again, I've seen the very strong criticisms of these priorities of Prime Minister Abe coming out of South Korea. And in back of this, as I think we all know, are these deep South Korean antagonisms towards Japan over the history issues. So my question is, in terms of this sentiment that we've been talking about, in the South Korean public, uh, in favor of South Korea having at least an option for nuclear weapons, and the question of how deep are these sentiments really held. Besides the recent North Korean actions, are these South Korean attitudes towards Japan an underlying factor in this seeming strengthening of South Korean public attitudes in support of a nuclear weapons options. And if in the next two to three years, Prime Minister Abe and his government move ahead with these programs and priorities that I have just mentioned, would these steps by Japan strengthen, expand, and solidify South Korean public attitudes supporting a nuclear weapons option and if, again, Japan moves in these directions, what kind of new security guarantees or assurances would South Korea or might South Korea seek from the United States? Panelists, who would like to answer? <laughs> Maybe me. Thank you very much uh, for the comment, uh, Mr. Bell, uh, and also a question from uh, Dr. Nix. Uh, as far as I know, I think the current South Korean that the opinion or debate about possible South Korea's its own nuclear option has nothing to do with the Japan, uh, the, the history issue, or Japan, you, as you highlighted, recent the Abe government uh, moved towards uh, Japan normalizing its own self-defense. Of course, it is always a concern in the South Korean public uh, sentiment. But that, as I don't think as that uh, nuclear uh, debate on South Korea was driven any by majorly by the uh, Japan. It was really a kind of instant, immediate response to this North Korea's uh, nuclear test uh, in early this year. But I think, yes, there might be some potential uh, um, cause for South Korean anxiety if uh, Abe government, uh, we don't know yet, but somehow this fall or next year uh, able to you know, uh, change its constitution and move ahead with uh, you know, the, the peace uh, constitution, changing it to normalizing self-defense, there might be some uh, concern and some debate in South Korea. But I don't know whether that will be enough for South Korea to say that, oh, so as a return, uh, you know, response to this Japan, we have to go for the nuclear. Still, to me, it's a little bit too, too much for Korean public to have that kind of uh, discussion. And this goes back to, and so what could be the best uh, remedy for that kind of issue? It all comes down to, again, it's uh, ROK US alliance. And as Mr. Uh, 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 Bell alluded, uh, when I sh uh, in my own uh, presentation, the Gallup poll, 
uh, show that 71% uh, of South Korean says U.S. is always the most important partner in this, uh, all this ongoing nuclear saga, as opposed to 18% uh, China is important or 2% Japan is important. So there is also genuine uh, uh, support among the South Korean uh, about this, uh, the U.S. ROK alliance, which is quite, in a way, different from just a few years uh, ago. I mean, early 2000, we had this difficulty of growing anti-Americanism within South Korean uh, society. But today, that is almost uh, just a non-issue anymore. It's, uh, it's also, I think, largely thanks to North Korea's continuing provocation. So the Korean public support and uh, their perception towards this alliance, that importance of alliance, is higher than any at any time. So that's just uh, one, I think, uh, maybe it's a key thing that we need to focus and uh, emphasize. Do you have any other comments from the panelists? All right. We have one minute left. <laughs> so if there are additional questions, we can only take them if they're short. I think we have one over here. Please state your name and affiliation and make it brief. Um, Duan from USKI, I have a brief question. A few decades ago, President uh, Park Chung-hee was interested in developing nuclear weapon. Do you think that still worries U.S. policymakers? <laughs> As a former U.S. policymaker, um, <laughs> the 2004 additional protocol disclosure to the IAEA pretty much put to rest in our minds that chapter in South Korea's history. Um, and that, again, I think goes to the point I made earlier that this is a country that was serious about showing us its nonproliferation credentials. And I would just leave it at that. Yeah. Uh, 72 case was uh, somewhat Korea was uh, uh, feeling like often we have uh, original sin. But I, I, I said, uh, no, you shouldn't. In the 70s, U.S. projected that there will be at least a 20 plus nuclear weapon countries in some years. So all countries who are having serious national security risks are thinking about nuclear weapons. It was not one Korea, it was 20 more. You know, even Germany, Switzerland, Taiwan, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, all the countries was thinking about nuclear weapons. But I would say that the Korea was the best success story. In 75, we quit the nuclear weapons throwaway program. I think mm -hmm. that was only in the ideas. I don't think that they really seriously pursue that. And then we turn to the uh, civilian nuclear energy program, and we become the best uh, success story. So we are not feel we we saw that happened, but uh, we are you should be much proud of that it happened afterwards. All right. Any uh, before we close, any final comments from either our speakers or discussants? No. Then please uh, join me in thanking our panelists. We have a short break until 11 a.m., and then we will reconvene with the next session. Thank you. <laughs>